So Ani and Wache and good evening and hello everyone. We're gonna begin our panel in a good way. I'm going to do a land acknowledgement. So I'm Jennifer David, Jennifer David and Tisna Kossin. I am Cree, I'm Inanu from Omashvego, which is Treaty 9 territory in Northeastern Ontario, Chapel Cree First Nation. And I always acknowledge the treaty territory that I'm from. I also acknowledge that I am now here in lovely Ottawa and I've been here for many years now. And I acknowledge that I'm on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Good evening and welcome to all who are tuning in to our International Women's Day Pandemic Shiro's panel this evening. I am Anna Basile, Division Manager of Corporate Services at Ottawa Public Library, and I am pleased to be introducing this evening's program. Tonight's event is part of OPL's programming for International Women's Day. And we know it was two weeks ago, but there are so many events on that day that can capture your attention. So we are pleased that you're able to join us this evening. As a predominantly female-led organization, we believe in celebrating our accomplishments. And tonight, I am honored to be here as we highlight the remarkable achievements of the strong, caring, and inspiring women that you will meet this evening. All of them have emerged during this pandemic as Shiro's. Ottawa Public Library's mission is to connect people and to support inclusive change through literacy and learning. I encourage you to visit the OPL website to discover a wide variety of program and events. And in honor of International Women's Day, you will find carefully curated reading lists in a variety of formats in English et aussi en français for all ages that will both move and delight you. I would like to congratulate our panelists for their compassion, their resilience, and their accomplishments. And I'd like to thank them for being here this evening. It is now my pleasure to reintroduce our moderator for the panel discussion. Jennifer David, as she previously mentioned, is Cree from Chapelot Cree First Nation in Treaty 9 territory. She now lives in Ottawa and works as a consultant with a majority Indigenous company called Envision Insight Group. She's a supporter of Ottawa Public Library and a voracious reader of Indigenous literature. She recently launched a podcast of Indigenous books called Story Keepers. And we encourage you to take a listen. Over to you, Jennifer, to introduce the panelists. And thank you, everyone, and enjoy this evening. Miigwech, and thank you very much, and welcome to our panel this evening. I would just like to let you know, those of us who've joined us on Zoom, please use the Q&A button if you have questions. And those of you who are watching on Facebook, please use your comments and uh, someone from OPL will be monitoring those and we'll try to get to, to some of your questions. So the format for this evening is uh, each of our panelists are going to talk about the work that they're doing, especially related to the pandemic. And then after they've all had a chance to present, I'll be asking them some a few generic questions, and then we'll open it up to you in the audience to ask questions that you want before we wrap it up. And this is a one hour presentation. So I am now going to turn uh, to, to tell you about our panelists. So we have three panelists with us, Dr. Ogisto Horn, we have Suzanne Obiora, sorry, Obiora, I didn't say that right now, Obiora, Obiora. She'll correct me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, and we have Megan White. And so we're gonna hear first from Dr. Ogisto Horn. Uh, Dr. Horn is Haudenosaunee. She's a family physician whose mother's from Ganawage and her father's from Akasasne. Providing full spectrum care to her people has been rewarding, challenging, and very thought provoking. She also sur supervises and teaches students and family medicine residents from Queens, McGill, and the University of Ottawa's medical schools. Her wide interests include environmental determinants of health and holistic approaches to providing primary care to Indigenous communities. And so I would like to turn it over to Dr. Horn to tell us more about the work that she's been doing. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be invited to this uh, wonderful panel on this extraordinary day or commemoration of an extraordinary day. And, um, and I'm, I'm here today, it's kind of full circle um, because um, I have spent many of my um, formative years in Ottawa. I, right now I live in Akwazasne. I am um, a mother of many children. I have um, 
a mom who's from Agunawage, my father's from Agwazasne, and I have families in both communities. I have worked in both communities as a family doctor, and uh, this past year has been extremely busy and um, and very uh, very enlightening. Mm. And um, things like Zoom have really opened up. Um, a whole new world of communication that um, that we can now access to talk to one another. So um, I just wanted to uh, talk about the fact that yes, I am uh, from Ganawage. I live in Agwazasne. I could say that I'm from both communities, but I can also say that I'm from Ottawa. And my story is very similar to many, many Indigenous people across uh, Canada um, and across Turtle Island, um, in that we are very, very mobile people going back and forth between our communities and the cities uh, for a various, uh, for, for many, many reasons. And in our case, we um, landed in Ottawa from Gahnawage when I was five and I had to learn English. I had to, um, you know, go to school and, um, and it was uh, very difficult at that time. It was at the same time as when the Vietnamese, um, the boat people were coming over to Canada and I was put in a class with them and I was thought to be Vietnamese. And I ended up going to school with these kids all the way to grade 13. And then we went back to Gunawage after the Oka crisis. Mm. So there has been a lot of um, political um, um, political waves that have gone in and out of my life, and so this um, has set me up to um, to really try and be the best advocate that I can be for um, for women, in particular Indigenous women. And so um, and so. Becoming a doctor has has been really, really difficult, but it's um, very fulfilling and it's not this focus of what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to talk about COVID. Mm. So this particular um, illness was not um, a big surprise to many traditional people. Mm. We have in our creation story uh, many, um, many, many stories and in which one of the main stories is about how the most um, dangerous the most um, scariest things that were in existence that were formed were pushed way off into places um, that were far away from the people so that they would not be hurt by these things. So they were put deep into the ice, deep into crevasses like caves, deep into the oceans, um, you know, deep in, into the woods. And so what happened was we were far away from them, but we knew that they were there. Mm -hmm. So over the course of the last several hundred years, the buffer that's existed between us and these things has slowly decreased to the point that now we are coming close and in contact with these things that we were never supposed to be in contact with. And so, um, and that's because the, the buffers that existed in the oceans and in the, the trees and, uh, and the ice have all been changing because of climate change. And so here we are today with a really fine example of the breakdown in the entire balance of, the, of our earth. And now we are confronted with a new problem, a new virus called COVID. And so we all know that this has been quite the year. So what's been so exciting about this past year is that when you stir a great big pot of stew, all sorts of stuff that's been stuck on the bottom comes right to the top and you're able to talk about stuff that really had been you know, put away. And so um, this particular year has been able, because of things like Zoom and you know, all these other formats, we've been able to talk to one another and now, there's a whole series of, or groups of different groups of people that I've been able to um, speak to regularly, including other indigenous doctors in our communities. And this has been fantastic. I've been able to um, talk regularly um, and learn about the experiences of people who are um, like me. Um, who are working in our communities trying to do the best and so um, for our people. And so um, there are lots and lots of stories that we've shared with one another, but one of the most important things is I recognize that I'm not alone. Mm. Such a problem with primary care in our communities and, um, and this has really brought it to light, but now we can talk to each other and now we can communicate really, really easily, not mm. once every few years. And it's been really powerful in that way. A lot of the women, a lot of the people who carry out primary care in our communities are women. 
we carry our babies through medical school, through nursing school, through all the different kinds of school to provide care to our people. And we really do have um, a specific knowledge, a specific kind of strength because we're able to multitask and we understand all of those uh, connections that help us succeed. We know how to engage family members and community members to help us through our studies and of course through work. Mm -hmm. So we really are community-based when we go back to um, our communities. And, um, and one of the things that when we talk about barriers to, um, to um, just being a female is the fact that this type of knowledge is not recognized. It's not something mm -hmm. that is paid for. It's not reflected in the job description. Things are, we're not accommodated. We're actually um, made to feel um, bad about having children and bringing them into uh, work with us or, or just having to think about them whenever we're um, trying to, uh, to do our works. So um, it's been a very, very interesting year. It's been, it, we've been able to look and bring all sorts of things into the surface. I'm so happy now that I've been able to connect with people that I haven't seen for a very, very long time. And I really, really appreciate the opportunity today to speak as a, as a, as a world citizen, um, as somebody who spent a lot of her formative years in Ottawa, but really my heart is back home in my communities of Ganawage and Okwazasne. And thank you very much. Mm. Miigwech, and thank you very much. I think your words were very powerful and very insightful. I like that you said, you know, that we're not alone. We are in this pandemic and we're celebrating International Women's Day in a unique way that we wouldn't have anticipated. And unfor it's unfortunate in a way, but you're right, we're not alone. We, we may be alone because we may be stuck in our houses, but we're not alone as we go through this. So I appreciated your words. Thank you for that. All right, we would like to hear now from uh, Suzanne Obi Obiora. Obiora. Obiora? Did I say it right this time? Perfect. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Suzanne Obiora is the director of the new Gender and Race, Equity, Indigenous Relations, Inclusion, and Social Development Branch at the City of Ottawa. That is a mouthful. <laughs> she has worked in health and social services for 18 years. Prior to joining the City of Ottawa, Suzanne was the Director of Primary Care and Regional Programs with Somerset West Community Health Centre. A strong advocate for culturally responsive mental health supports in the Black community, Suzanne is also the co-founder of the Ottawa Black Mental Health Coalition, and she will speak about her work in the community. Oh, thank you um, so much for having me here this evening. and. Uh, such a powerful and beautiful story to hear, um, uh, Dr. Horns. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Uh, I'm 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 still processing and quite inspired uh, by your story. Hard hard to follow, um, but I will talk just a little bit about some of the work uh, that I've been uh, doing and some of the things that I'm quite passionate about as it relates to uh, mental health supports um, in the Black community. Uh, but, but as shared, I joined the city of Ottawa. Uh, I've been here uh, seven weeks uh, in this new role and <laughs> quite uh, excited about what's to come out of the service area. Uh, but uh, at, at Somerset West, um, uh, my portfolio oversaw uh, four programs that serviced about 15,000 clients each year. And um, nearly half of the people that were accessing our services within my portfolio had an income, an annual income of less than $15,000. Uh, and most of them faced significant barriers, um, housing issues, food insecurity, uh, experiences of, of racism and discrimination, uh, language barriers, mental illness, um, the, the list goes on. And so I've been a very strong advocate that programs and services that are meant to support our community are accessible, mm -hmm. um, culturally competent, um, uh, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach to the diversity that exists within our, within our community and really ensuring that um, the work that we're doing and services that we're offering are reflective of the communities uh, in which we serve. And so my, my work has been very much focused on creating low barrier access um, uh, to responsive programming and uh, speaking up at tables to ensure that there is nimbleness and flexibility in um, in any of the, the services that we're uh, providing and really championing for uh, health equity frameworks and accountability attached to those uh, health equity frameworks. So 
I, I've been at tables where I flag the need to engage more in vo uh, more voices around the table when it comes to issues of mental health um, to support uh, Black communities. I, I've sat at many health system planning tables, and when we look at structuring and access points to um, uh, uh, mental health systems, unfortunately, in Black communities, the main entry points tend to be through the criminal justice system, through um, uh, children protection uh, services, um, and through uh, law enforcement. And we need um, safer entry points uh, to receive um, uh, mental health uh, support. Uh, some of the challenges that I face, though, in sitting at these tables is that I'm, I'm often uh, the only uh, Black leader around the table. and. Uh, and the danger in flagging uh, a need to engage more voices or flagging the problem has often led to um, see, uh, me being that person to provide uh, the solution. And of course, I cannot speak on behalf of the close to 70,000 Black members in the community. And so, so my voice is very much around needing to ensure that the table is properly set to engage in such uh, discussions. Uh, uh, you know, we shared earlier that I am a very strong mental health advocate for accessible services that um, meet the, the various needs uh, in the Black community. And as a result, I co-founded the Ottawa Black Mental Health Coalition, which is a network of um, close to 30 Black leaders in health and social services, academics, uh, community associations. And we've been convening um, for some time now to identify system changes um, and also to provide those um, responsive uh, services. Um, currently within our mental health uh, system, there's um, interest now in culturally informed resources, but we're not well set up. We don't have the, the representation yet to provide that. Um, and, and there is you know, persistence of anti-Black racism. There's stigma attached to mental illness in the Black communities and dealing with these issues become very, um, very challenging and, and complex. Uh, and in, in some instances, what it leads to is um, a silent struggle where members in my community are not uh, seeking support. So this work started before COVID and, and COVID absolutely uh, complicated, uh, complicated issues. And as we've seen in much of the, uh, the media, uh, COVID has disproportionately impacted uh, racialized communities, particularly um, black communities and, and mental health experts are expecting a surge of, of health issues and mental health issues once we get past this uh, pandemic, but, but we're already seeing you know, a lot of issues around um, um, survival uh, and supports uh, during COVID. And so, so what, uh, what the coalition has been doing, we've, we've been able to mobilize rather quickly um, to respond. And that's through uh, free counseling sessions um, by uh, Black psychotherapists to members in uh, the Black community uh, to offer a, a safe space to talk about, um, you know, experiences of racism and discrimination, as well as, you know, other mental health issues, um, embedding services right in uh, the community. And so trying to move away from some of the mainstream institutional type um, responses to, um, you know, neighborhood uh, engagement and, and um, uh, and services that are, are embedded in, in communities, uh, wellness checks, food distribution, crisis supports, um, providing groceries, masks, personal protective equipment, you know, virtual education sessions, um, engaging, engaging with uh, faith leaders and offering tools to faith leaders on how to address uh, mental health crises. It's not, often, it's not uncommon in our community to express uh, concerns to your faith leader. And so we wanted to ensure that the faith leader would be ready and armed to respond to some of the crisis that's, that's sur uh, surfacing. Um, and, and we also have been doing some anti-racism training for mental health professionals, um, you know, access points to mental health supports are across the spectrum, be it in the community or in some of the mainstream services. And so wanting to raise awareness around, um, you know, what culturally responsive um, mental health supports look like and, and what anti-racism type mental health support uh, looks like and, and have been really engaging the community to understand more, you know, what are the problems and, and what, what does the community feel are some uh, solutions to decrease that stigma, increase uh, confidence, you know, respond and manage to uh, some of the supports um, or crisis that they, they need and, and what does good support uh, look like so I've been really happy that um, 
you know, uh, over this past year, we've, you know, we've been able to really empower uh, the community. And I think the beauty of the coalition is the power uh, in community um, and um, have been uh, able to infiltrate at a few different levels uh, um, within the system level amongst health system leaders, but, but more importantly with, uh, with uh, members of our community, um, being able to see people that you can identify with and, and, and talk about um, their issues. So, you know, I come to this panel uh, with, with many different uh, uh, lenses. I come here as a wife and a mother of three and a daughter, sister, niece, all of those female mm -hmm. uh, titles, I suppose. Uh, and then lastly, I guess I come uh, as, a, as a director um, and, and have been really trying to use my, um, uh, my, my position when able to uh, advance uh, issues and, and speak a lot about um, uh, diversifying the response and the programs and services that we offer to reflect what our, our different communities need. And I'll leave it there for now. That's so fascinating. I, I could I could listen to you speak about all the different things you're working on. Very, very, uh, you're doing such important work. I really liked what you said uh, that you go to where the people are, which is what, what you do as well, Dr. Huang, right? We, we know where the needs are and you, you are actually going to where you're going to find those community members and helping them. So I think that was really good. And when you said there's power in community, I really liked that. That's, um, again, that's really important work that you're doing. Thank you for that. And I'm going to turn now to uh, Megan White. So Megan is the co-founder of Period Packs an Ottawa-based nonprofit dedicated to addressing menstrual inequality in Canada. Megan is a longtime patient advocate with over 10 years of experience working to ensure rare disease patients in Canada have equitable access to healthcare resources. With the founding of Period Packs, Megan is applying that experience to the advancement of women's health with, of course, a focus on menstrual health. She is passionate about mentorship, developing social enterprises, and building strong communities that work for everyone. She will talk about grassroots efforts to address menstrual inequality. Megan. Unmute myself. I'm always that person who struggles <laughs> with the mute button, but I'm here, I'm here for it. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I'm amongst very good company and uh, I really enjoyed both of your um, talks so far. And it's a tough act to follow, but I think I can throw my hat in the ring and have a couple things to add. So like we, I was just prompted, I'm going to talk to you about menstrual inequity today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the efforts that we're making here in Ottawa, or what we're doing uh, on the ground right now to address it and really what menstrual inequity is and um, the different aspects that are contributing to Canadians not being able to access menstrual products. So two years ago, my co-founder who couldn't be here, unfortunately, Lauren and I uh, went to make donations on International Women's Day of menstrual products because it's a hugely important day for me and I always try and do something that's tangible in my own community. Uh, on that day, whatever that may be. So in, this turned out to be the donation of menstrual products to an organization I've long since supported called Cornerstone Housing for Women. I'm sure uh, most people who are tuning in today are familiar with the organization. Ultimately, after what I thought would be a huge donation uh, was dropped off, about $100 worth of menstrual products, I quickly realized that that was a drop in the bucket. And then I started thinking, well, if they need menstrual products, other places need menstrual products. And despite my own experiences working as a frontline worker at the Shepherds of Good Hope, working with the Parkdale Food Center, CMHA, um, Psychiatric Survivors of Ottawa, amongst others, um, it access to menstrual products had somehow fallen through the cracks there. Mm. When we thought about access to essential services or helping community members meet their basic needs, that was a piece that was not being talked about. And that was the piece that even, like I said, with my own firsthand experience in the community and working in these roles, menstrual equity and access to products wasn't on the agenda. And so I knew that there had to be something systemic going on here and that this was a much wider uh, problem than I could have imagined. Mm -hmm. So I got on Google, 
went down the rabbit hole, started <laughs> researching what the state of menstrual equity actually looks like here in Canada, because many people who, myself included, who I talked to about this issue, it very much immediately it seems like an, an other. That's an issue somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's an issue in developing countries. We don't have that problem here in Canada, but unfortunately the statistics say otherwise. And mm -hmm. we're looking at a really serious community problem where one third of young Canadians under the age of 25 have reported not being able to access menstrual products. 63% of those surveyed from Plan Canada, um, they do a kind of audit on the state of menstrual equity in many countries around the world. And uh, our chapter here uh, has done the same. So 63% of uh, women and girls that were survey reported missing work because they didn't have access to the menstrual products they needed to manage their cycle. 58% have felt the need to lie about being on their period and 47% of all people surveyed have been teased or ridiculed from male colleagues, friends, or family about being on their period. Hmm. And I chose that group of statistics specifically because, well, there is the material deprivation of not having physical access to the menstrual products. There, This is a very dynamic issue. And stigma, uh, of course, a lack of um, education and a lack of access are all compounding together to, you know, prevent women and girls from managing their cycle and ultimately uh, becoming a barrier and then managing their own health uh, and having sustained bodily autonomy. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to look at all the different factors and that's why period packs is built around a three pillar program and it's access activism and education. Mm -hmm. So the access component is what we're doing right now in the city of Ottawa period packs provides menstrual products directly to community members and through third party community uh, agencies. We service about 450 individuals a month, providing them with enough uh, menstrual cycle of their choosing, or excuse me, menstrual products of their choosing to manage their cycle safely uh, and with dignity. We work with about 24 uh, and growing community agencies from community houses to community centers and drop-in centers and all sorts of programming uh, to make sure that we're providing as many access points as as possible so where there's people there should be free access to to menstrual products mm -hmm. the activism component looks a lot like what i'm doing right now it looks like accepting every engagement that i can you know get on a soapbox and talk about the problem that we're facing together and it also looks a lot like uh, partnering with uh, policymakers. you know sitting down with the city of ottawa writing letter you know sorry, hosting letter writing campaigns and really trying to connect all of the different uh, players who could either have an interest in solving this problem or who could make a difference in solving this problem. And the education component, uh, we will be there now that we're going to be able to see people a little bit more over the summer, be hosting uh, workshops about menstrual health, leadership and menstrual uh, equity and sexual and reproductive health. We also have an amazing youth advisory uh, board and we work with um, nine young girls between the ages of 12 and 17 and they create programming for period packs and we mentor them to create peer to peer programming about menstrual health. Um, and uh, I guess I'll just say really clearly using those three pillars, what kind of our mission is in a few words, and really it is to eradicate menstrual inequity in Canada. And we're trying to do that through the advocacy, uh, education and, and access component. And we really try and work with the public and private sector and kind of, you know, come up with solutions or keep tabs on and watchdog and make sure meaningful you know, efforts are being made to find solutions together because it's never going to be solved by just putting them in a workplace bathroom or making sure one school board is providing the products or one municipality or yada, 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 yada goes on and on um, that the solution to this, the buck gets passed quite a bit and we're, we need to work together uh, from a municipal, provincial, and federal level to put menstrual equity on the agenda. I'm sure that after everything I've said, you can start connecting the dots and just see that 
this is such a dynamic problem and that the impacts that that has on an individual's life are far reaching. When you miss school, when you miss out on a social engagement, when you miss out on work, when 80% of Canadians have no idea that uh, people who menstruate have such complex periods that they miss school and work in the first place, mm -hmm. that there's this huge disconnect that half our population is having, you know, this tremendous experience once a month for 30 plus years, and it's not on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I'd like to see communities not you know, silence menstruators, but to build communities and to build institutions around menstruation and to encourage people to talk about their cycle because it is just that, it's a cycle, it's a full month. When we talk about menstrual health and women's health, you know, the menstrual cycle should be at the center of that mm -hmm. and that you have to, you know, kind of grin and bear it through school or through work or whatever that might be, and that you can't express your full lived experience out of fear of shame and stigma. There are a lot of problems with that, but I'm hopeful mm -hmm. that that we can move past that as a community. And there's amazing efforts being made across the country uh, with school boards on provincial levels and municipal I won't get into them because I do want to add one other thing um, so I don't go over my time and that's the effort being made here through COVID that period packs has created a pilot program in conjunction with the city of Ottawa to address menstrual inequity on a larger scale here in the city so the pilot program uh, which started a few weeks ago has provided universal access in six priority neighborhoods as identified through the Ottawa equity index um, and then there's three touch points within each community, just because of the intermittent um, closures of the community centers themselves, it was important to ensure that there was consistent access to products. So these products can be found within the community centers, the community health centers, and the, I'll say community one more time, <laughs> and the community uh, house centers, like the community hub within the community housing area and that's going to be going on for the rest of the year i'm very hopeful that the uptake is going to be good and that the city will expand the program permanently in 2022 but keep tabs on that because we're going to need to rally together uh, to pitch that at the end of the year at the for the 2022 budget mm -hmm. meeting but we are making uh, headway here in Ottawa. I'm really proud of the work that period packs in the city are, are doing together to really address this mm. problem. Mm. How am I doing for time? Oh, that's good. That's great. great. It, are you have more to say or are you finished? No, I think, I think that's it. And we're going to have, you know, <laughs> some, some conversations and some chats in a bit. So I'll leave it till then. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, we great to thank you for your presentation. I, Again, I, I must admit, I didn't think about this idea of menstrual equality. I think you really sort of opened my eyes to, to some of these things. Uh, and it is definitely a missing piece. So thank you for educating all of us on that. I do remember hearing in the news that there was a, a debate about taxing menstrual products. I just remember that in the news. And you think like, this is 2021, right? And this is what we're talking about, right? Whether or not they should be taxed. So. I can see why you're passionate about this uh, this issue, and uh, what I what I thought was interesting that both you, Suzanne, and what you had said, Megan, was you both mentioned that word stigma, and that you're both specifically working to address uh, different barriers. And same with you, uh, Dr. Horn, that that there are stigmas, that there are sort of barriers out there. Um, what I'd like to ask each of you is whether you have seen because we're here for International Women's Day and, and I have, have three fabulous women here, in the work that you do and as a woman, what would you say are the lingering barriers? This is 2021, but we, are, we do still have barriers as women. And then maybe are there more or different kinds of barriers during this pandemic or, or are there fewer barriers because of COVID or, or has it left open something for, for fewer people? barriers and I open it up to to any of you who, who would like to answer that I'll jump in really quickly if if I can 
uh, just to start the conversation. And I think one of the consistent barriers is that uh, women and girls lived experience is met with suspicion and doubt mm. that there is, that there's this need you know what, I'll backtrack. It's not even a need because the statistics speak for themselves as well. So despite the concrete data and information and women and girls explicitly sharing their lived experience, there is this insidious suspicion that you know it's exaggerated or we're not telling the truth or it can't be that bad. And um, that idea that women are are maybe a little hysterical or that they're they're not telling their whole truth is is a huge problem i'll leave it to someone else if they want to add or redirect or chat about something else mm -hmm. and dr horn were you going to unmute on that one yeah i was going to go off in a different um, field um, one of the things that has come out of this um this um, isolation that we've had over the past year are um, women's uh, previous um, ability to um, find and engage and find the supports to, to keep them um, safe have mm. uh, somewhat decreased. So the mm. uh, amount of uh, domestic violence, right. um, the violence against women has um, increased. And, um, mm. And so just being aware of that, we have to keep our eyes open as community people to uh, look for that. Um, we've also, the, 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 the types of systems in our communities um, that would have previously kept us safe, kept the women safe, mm -hmm. um, have also broken down. We mm -hmm. um, have had more difficulty, um, for instance, going to do our ceremonies where you would have been able to, um, you know, um, just touch base and um, keep yourself healthy, and you know, go through ceremony to be able to um, reconnect with your 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 spirit and your um, and and your own health, your spiritual health, and um, and of course family. And now we haven't been able to do that, so it it, it has been a really big barrier. The the fact that we cannot, as women, access those spaces mm -hmm. that we could before that would have protected us. Um, for a number of uh, a number of things that we do need protection from. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Thank you. And I know um, Suzanne, you you talked a lot about mental health, and I know we we hear that you know mental health has been really difficult on people during this pandemic. And would you have anything else to add about that, especially for women, and in in your case, Black women, and the barriers now during COVID? You know, it, it's interesting because our narrative. Um, around women is progressive. And the celebration of International Women's Day is, is exactly an acknowledgement of how we have progressed. Mm -hmm. Yet the pandemic has demonstrated and is telling a different story in that, notwithstanding our progress, um, COVID has disproportionately impacted women. And I'll just share you know, because the question is around barriers and, and it's, you know, I, I'd love for us to really reflect on this. There's some stats that Ottawa Citizen published um, and, and Ottawa Public Health has also released some information around women are experiencing more job losses than men and, and being slower to return to work, partic particularly for women who have children between the ages of six to 17, they're, they're going back to work at a slower uh, rate. And you know this is especially true for for immigrant uh, women who um, are experiencing lower rates of transition back uh, into employment. Women are are still shouldering at a disproportionate amount caregiving responsibilities, education responsibilities when their children are out of school and, and daycare. And we're seeing an overrepresentation of women in frontline work, or what we've you know the, the common term of essential services. Um, and and what uh, what we're seeing with women being overrepresented in this type of work is increased exposure to contracting uh, COVID. Um, I, I won't, uh, you know, I'll I'll just affirm or acknowledge what Dr. Horn's saying about the domestic violence piece, and 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 we have absolutely seen increases in domestic violence during COVID against uh, women and 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 gender diverse uh, people, and. Um, what we've learned through data, and, and data is so powerful in helping us to understand where the gaps are, 
and so critical for us to continue to capture it and then help inform what we're going to do next as a result of having that data is that COVID is disproportionately impacting women and it's disproportionately impacting racialized women. Um, black women um, at, at the highest level are the hardest um, that are being hit in this community. And so, uh, you know, it, it's no doubt that it's having an impact on mental health. Um, there's no question when we think about the root causes to what's impacting our, our mental health, we need to look at all those societal factors that we are uh, uh, living through and navigating uh, through. And um, Ottawa Public Health shared that close to 50% of the women said that their mental health was fair or poor, significantly higher than those of men. So there's, there's vulnerabilities in our society that we're aware of. And, you know, we're continuing with championing um, the progress that women are making in education and financial equity in, in, um, in leadership positions, but there's still a significant uh, gap Mm -hmm. and 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 part of it's you know and there's it's 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 complex <laughs> why why that that gap is um but but you know what we're what we're appreciating here is that uh you know women are are, are being disproportionately impacted and and even more so if you're if you're a racialized woman mm -hmm. if you're an indigenous woman if you're a senior if you're living with disabilities and a woman and the list goes on and on um and so and it, it cross cuts you know different sectors of society um, and so there's still work to do around um, narrowing that disparity um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, but 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 that in and of itself that disparity is is the barrier right right well uh, all three of you 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 all saw a need within your communities and you all stepped up to fill those needs so you know, I, I, I give you all, all credit for that because sometimes we see a lot of needs around us, but either we don't feel equipped to address it or we're not willing, or we say somebody else will take care of that. But you know, that, that you are three women that are stepping up to, to do what you can in your own spheres of influence is, is inspirational. And I, I, would, I would think that those of you who do step up, you have, you have some hope because you feel that you can make a difference. So I want to ask all of you, what do you see around you? Again, even though we are in COVID and even there are all these barriers and there have been terrible things that we have to think about that COVID has done, especially for women. But what do you see around you that gives you hope for, for young girls today and the world that they're going to inherit when they become women, do you see some signs of hope? And has COVID done anything to help uh, move that forward, or is everything sort of been set back? But do, do you feel? Do you have any sort of hope? Do you, what, what do you see and have hope for in the future? So one of the um, the uh, most important things that I've seen in the community is this recognition that we need to start taking care of ourselves. Um, or a lot of people made um, the uh, planting boxes and started learning how to plant again, started to, um, you know, participate in, you know, tapping the trees for the maple syrup, started to, you know, engage in activities outside. Um, you know, more people recognized how important it is for us to start to turn away from all the electronics and start to look outside. You know, we are embarking not just outside, we're not just leaving COVID behind, but we are entering the next 10 years where we have incredible global stress um, towards Mother Earth. And we need to slow down and reverse that. And that's going to take a monumental change in the psyche of humankind mm -hmm. humans, to be able to start to think not so much about personal rights, but start to think about the collective responsibility and start to make decisions that may be uncomfortable, but at least we'll start thinking about, um, about helping um, our, you know, the help the, 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 the space for our children to mm -hmm. grow and, and have healthy lives. 
Um, that might be a bigger change for some people than others, um, but important for everybody. And so I have a lot of hope because I think what COVID did was it made us really reevaluate the importance of going back to basics. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was absolutely necessary for us to start looking towards a future where we think really hard about um, the earth's health and how our, our relationship is reciprocal and how she gives to us and we have to give back in a good way. And so to me, um, I have a lot more hope and we have a lot of girls and women who now have a voice, who didn't have a voice before, who had to work really hard to find that voice. And I think that the space to be able to speak is so important and um, this, um, this is a whole different world than it was one year ago. So uh, that's why I'm hopeful. Mm, excellent, thank you for that perspective. I, I would love to jump off that and say that I am absolutely hopeful. You know, it, it, it's true that we started off with a bit of doom and gloom around COVID, but many silver linings um, uh, around how the community has banded together to care for each other. And so that, uh, that's given me hope. And I've been, I've been really um, encouraged with, uh, you know, I talk about the community coming together, but also, you know, industry, health and social services, people are really paying attention to who is being impacted by this. Mm. And how do we collectively work together to improve the livelihood um, uh, uh, of, of, our, of our community? And the conversation isn't about trying to convince you know, which groups are being more disadvantaged and which groups do we have to pay attention to. The conversation is how <laughs> do we right. help? So we've, we've just moved miles away um, or miles ahead rather uh, in this collective uh, way forward. And then in terms of you know, a hopefulness for our girls, um, uh, you know, I have just been so impressed with the positive messaging mm. that amplifies women empowerment in in many different spheres and you know I, I pay more attention to what's happening uh, in Canada so I have to speak for for what's happening uh, in Canada and I don't think it's fair to generalize uh, globally but but certainly here you know in 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 our pop culture in our literature in you know varied industries and you know even in some of our politics we are seeing um women really uh, amplifying uh, their voice and that's empowering uh, to our, our young girls. Uh, and I'm impressed with the confidence that's coming through. You know, I have a seven-year-old, uh, a four-year-old, a seven-year-old and a 16-year-old and my 16-year-old's a, a, a boy, but I'm so uh, impressed with the confidence and the conversations that they're having. And, and they're talking about equity but, but, you know, in a language that's just so natural uh, to them, we're not having to explain the importance of equity uh, in this age group. And so I think they're going to be really confused by why it's taken us so long to get here. When it's so, uh, you know, entrenched, it seems, in, in the lessons in school uh, and in their everyday conversation. And then just watching the leadership you know, of these young girls and watching the emerging social supports and the social networks of these girls. Mm -hmm. I've been so impressed with their, um, their agency and um, their active, their civic engagement. Um, there, there's a fierce, you know, society that's uh, emerging and taking space. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's, what, uh, that's what gives me a hope. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you saying that. I also, I have a 16 year old daughter and same thing, you know, when she sees, you know, inequality, she's like, I don't get it. What, what, what's going on here, right? Like it's just second nature, right? So it is, uh, I, I have that same hope. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, maybe? Oh, nothing that hasn't already been said. <laughs> um, I guess the, the only thing that I would quickly add is that I am a hopeful that this situation has exposed a shaky foundation mm -hmm. and that we're not trying to put out fires anymore or mm -hmm. that we've started to look at the bigger picture, mm -hmm. started to look at, okay, maybe what we were building wasn't on a solid foundation. Maybe there has to be foundational changes made 
to our communities, to our social mm -hmm. structures, and let's start building anew in a better and stronger way. And so mm -hmm. I've been very pleased to see these kind of bigger questions and the whole mm -hmm. systems being questioned to right. find larger overarching solutions. And I think that, that we are seeing that again. I, I work in, in the indigenous communities and you know that's what systemic institutional racism is. It's we we need to break down those you know, what we think are foundations, which really are shaky. So that was a really interesting point. I do have a couple of questions from uh, our, our audience, our listeners here, and I'd like to ask those. So I'm gonna read them and let's see what they say. So um, Alexis says, wow, love that lingering barriers, menopause and perimenopause, understanding a woman's moon time and many mental health stigmas attached to both these phases in a, in a woman's journey. Love all the work each of you are doing. I am a Gwich'in woman. What is one thing someone like me can do to help or be of service? And Dr. Horn wants to answer that one. Yes, please go ahead. So um, one of the things, um, actually I'm a family doctor and one of the things we do as family doctors is that we um, help people walk through different um, parts of their life cycle. So where I'm from, we talk about different, you know, there's the conception, birth, childhood, adolescence, and then young adulthood with motherhood, menopause, and then death. So that's like seven. And, um, and so we as family doctors help people through those times. We also have a tr deep traditional knowledge that does the same thing. And if we can learn how to do them together, that would be just so powerful. Mm. But we also have um, this idea of having um, different roles, different things that we're supposed to do when we go through each um, phase. So when you're going through from, you know, from um, a young adulthood into um, through menopause into an older woman, um, your basket is, is emptied and you take all the diapers and all this. <laughs> and now you full it. And now this is the time of medicine. This is the time where you are supposed to take all of those things that you have thought about and experienced um, and, and put them in your basket and put all of your medicines into your basket and become, become a wise person so that when you're asked questions, you can reflect on your generation and the experience of the people around you and your mother and your mother's mother or parents' parents. And so, and then their great grandparents ahead of you. And now you see your children, your children's children and your great grandchildren. That's seven generations mm -hmm. of experience that you can go and reflect on and take all of that knowledge and put it in your basket and you become a wise person. So these people are the most important people in our society, the people who have all of this knowledge. And if you take all of those minds and you, you, you put it together to make a, to form um, um, a thought, mm -hmm. I mean, that is just so powerful. We can't forget that those are the people who are the grandparents of mm -hmm. the young ones that we were just talking mm -hmm. about for hope. Um, it's gonna take all of us to figure out how to get through this, but carrying the basket of knowledge is super important. That's what I've just done. I've just handed <laughs> out my basket and now I've got this new one. And I have to say, at first I was very angry that I was going through this new phase, but then I realized yeah. well, actually that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And part of that is about teaching. And so that's why one of the reasons why I've embarked on quite a lot of teaching. So for this person who is at this stage in her life, that's a whole accumulation of a lot of experience and it's a really special time. Oh, thank you so much for that. Very wise words indeed. I do have another question. Uh, you are all tremendously impressive and hardworking rock stars. In honor of International Women's Day this month, do you have a memorable or pivotal moment where you felt like a strong woman? When I birthed my children. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I talked before about um, bringing the, my children, dragging them through my education. And um, so when I, um, when I finished medical school and was walking across the stage and, you know, at that time I had, you know, five children 
And um, it just was so overwhelming because I had been told my entire life that there was no way I was ever going to be a doctor, much less when I had children. It, there was absolutely no way that was going to happen. And then, um, but, but did. And it was just so um, overwhelming and rewarding. And it was really important um, to be able to do that in um, traditional clothing and um, and with my kids there to watch um, so that's when I felt really really strong because I was I was showing them this is what you can do you just because you have all of these other things that are irresponsible for doesn't mean that you can't do just about anything mm, thank you thank you I I'm lucky because of what, what I do and the spirit that I work in with women's health and menstrual uh, equity specifically, I feel strong every time I get to talk about periods. Every time I get to have a conversation that until now I'm 31 years old uh, would have been deemed inappropriate or would have made me uncomfortable or the other person person I was engaging with uncomfortable every time and this is what I encourage everyone to do I think if you ever want to work towards um, equitable access and and to improve outcome for women and girls as it relates to menstruation is to just start talking about periods your lived experience is powerful your story has power and we have um, the knowledge of half the population to build on and so every time I get to have that little talk I, I feel great and it's a small act of rebellion and I know that um, through conversation that I'm chipping away at a, a serious stigma and a very serious barrier for women and girls so just keep talking about periods it's very empowering I just I do want to add because I don't know if I gave enough of an answer though I am very uh proud to have birthed my kids. But I think if I was going to uh, just add a little bit more, because I, I really appreciated what Megan was saying is, um, is the, uh, the sense of accomplishment in being true uh, to yourself and the power that you have in your story and the confidence that you can find in sharing your story. And it's not always easy. And the table is not always set to hear what you have to say. And oftentimes there's, you know, the body language that's demonstrating that uh, it, your, your message isn't resonating. And, and that can be deflating, um, uh, but there's nothing more powerful than, you know, staying true to yourself and true to your voice and, and not getting discouraged by, um, uh, by that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that there's a tremendous power in the authenticity mm -hmm. of yourself. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We have less than uh, five minutes to go. So I just have one final question. Since this event is being sponsored by the Ottawa Public Library, I'm gonna ask each of you, what is on your bookshelf these days? And do you have any books to recommend, particularly books by or about women? So Robin Kimmerer, um, wrote a book about braiding sweetgrass. It's about 20 years old, but um, it's accessible. She reads it in the most beautiful way in her audible, you know, in an audio file. Mm. Um, and it is, you can read it over and over again and find something new in it every time. I'm also right now reading a book. It's called The Bear. And it's by Andrew Kravak. And uh, my children read it. And they were brought to tears. And I thought, well, babe, boy, I better read that book. And so um, reading what my kids are reading too. Okay, so that was The Bear and the other one was called Braiding Sweetgrass. Thank you. Go, go, go ahead. What is on my bookshelf? Well, you can sort of take a peek. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, a, I, I love books. And they can't all fit on my bookshelf, but um, I've got a few on the go. Uh, I, I actually listen to most of my books, but still need the hard copy in my house. Uh, so right now I'm listening to Finding My Voice by uh, Valerie Jarrett. Valerie Jarrett was the senior advisor for Barack Obama oh. during his presidency for the full eight years of his presidency. Um, 
But uh, uh, in terms of, uh, actually, I've got a few books on the go, Mediocre by Ijama uh, Olu and uh, Becoming by uh, Michelle uh, Obama. So I flip back and forth based on my mood. Um, but in terms of books, I would recommend my Anything by uh, Chimamanda Ngazi Adichie. Chimamanda Ngazi Adichie is um, a, a well-known author. She's well-known for her, uh, her, her work in feminism. And mm -hmm. she's from my tribe, uh, which is the Igbo tribe uh, in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And what I love about her stories, they're, they're, they're very powerful and they always take place um, maintaining the Igbo culture. And so while she writes in English, she speaks very much about Igbo culture and she infuses Igbo language throughout mm -hmm. the book. And it was, you know, the first author that I ever read that I could, you know, identify with in the way um, mm -hmm. uh, that I did, but also appreciate how many other people who were not Igbo could right. really uh, uh, enjoy her stories. That's the beauty of books, right? Relating to them too. Okay, and Megan, how about you? Yes, so they're all very on brand. They're all about <laughs> vaginas and about women and you know, the titles will tell you just that, but um, for books that I recommend, I think uh, one of the very funny, cute, and most impactful and accessible books um, that I've read in a long time is called The Vagina Bible. It's basically a manual to having a vagina. It's by an amazing <laughs> phys Canadian physician uh, named Jen Gunter, and she is uh, you know, read her book, follow her on Instagram, follow her on Twitter. Mm -hmm. She uh, debunks any kind of you know, pseudoscience related to women's health, especially that is, you know, toted out through social media and through pop culture. She also has another book that's coming out in about a week called The Menopause Manifesto. Um, so I've read a little excerpt from that. It sounds amazing as well. A book that I recently read that just, I basically started over as soon as I was finished. It was so remarkable. It's called Scarborough. Uh, and that's by Catherine Hernandez. And it's a, a quick book. I think it's about, I don't know, 100 pages. But it's about the experience of community members living in Scarborough. Um, and a lot of, well, material deprivation that community members there experience. Uh, but through the lens of about five different people and their stories, uh, it's obviously Canadian as well. Um, Scarborough being just outside of out of Toronto. And if I could do one more <laughs> that I'm getting into, um, it's called uh, Pain and the Prejudice. So that's by Gabriella Jackson. And it is a call to arms for women and their body. And that entire um, book is nonfiction, but it revolves around uh, demystifying women's bodies and about um, articulating and you know, paying minds to women's pain and the history of not having your pain um, accepted or treated or paid attention to both, you know, through the medical system and as a society uh, as a whole. And I'm just getting into that one, but it's, it's amazing as well. Okay, well, miigwech, to miigwech, thank you, all of you. I'm hoping someone from OPL will be able to at least include that list of books somehow with the recording of this. I don't know what's possible, but I'm hoping something's possible. So thank you all very much. Uh, we are now finished this. I'm, I, I could talk for many hours with all of you. That was a wonderful conversation. Thank you all very much. And we'll end our session and I'll say good evening to all of you. Thank you.